You know, it's quite amazing what's been happening over the last few months. What we are going to use tonight is dominantly what's happened in the last four or five months. And it shows to us indeed that the scriptures is being fulfilled precisely and that Christ's return is very near at hand. But first let's just begin with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said to us that there shall be upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The word perplexity means in the Greek no way out. That's exactly what we're seeing now. Men's hearts are failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Look at the grim scene that we're seeing. We're going to look at that a little later in a bit more detail. But look what Jesus said will be the result of that. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And so we can see that time is indeed very short. Christ's return cannot be far away. The time when Christ will return to offer to those who have sought him in this time the, way of, uh, the life of redemption, life eternal, is very, very near. Well, I want to first of all look at Ezekiel 38. Now, we just had read to us the earlier part of this chapter. And I want to show to you that what he is talking about is what's happening now. Look at this. When my people of Israel dwell safely, or the margin, confidently. So the Jews are in the land of Israel again. He says, at that time there will be an invasion. We'll pick this up again in a minute. And thou shalt come against my people Israel, and it shall be in the latter days. When will that be? Clearly, it's in the near future. Already Israel's back in the land, the Jews are there, and it is indeed the latter days. And he says at that time, a great invasion will take place. So what does it describe? Well, it describes an invasion that coming out of the north parts, a mighty army. Now remember that, because we're going to come back to them in a second. So it's out of the north parts. It's a future invasion of the land of Israel. And so what, what do we expect? Well, take that word there, north parts. The RSV version says the uttermost parts of the north. Now, if you go from Israel, where Ezekiel was prophesying, and go absolutely to the north, you can only go so far, that's the North Pole. If it's the outermost parts of the North Pole, or the north, it can't be far away from that North Pole. And here we are, going through Jerusalem. If you go through Jerusalem, you almost exactly go through Moscow. It's the area of Russia. It's the area of Russia, the uttermost parts of the north, from which that invasion comes. Now look back with me to verse 2. Now we know these words, most of us, very well. Rotherham's version translates it, Go to the land of Mago, prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now the King James version doesn't have it quite that way. It says the chief prince, but that word chief is better rendered Rosh. That's the Hebrew word. And almost every modern version, almost every modern version, renders it as Rosh. Now what does this word Rosh mean? Well, the leading lexino lexiconographer is the lexicon Jesenius. Now in Jesenius, here talking about this very chapter we're looking at, Ezekiel 38 and 39, where it's referred to, he says... This power, Rosh, is undoubtedly the Russians. So the outermost parts of the north, undoubtedly the Russians. But notice that it's a line with other countries. We read about it. Magog and various other countries. Goma, Ethiopia, Libya, Persia. What are these countries? Well, let's take the European ones first of all. So Gog of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And later on, it speaks of Goma. So here we are, there's Russia, the old Russia that we knew a little time ago as the USSR, but that will be united together, it says, and it will be affiliated with Germany, the bigger Germany, and the area of Goma, which is therefore France. So we've got Western Europe there, united with Eastern Europe, and that power 
comes into the Middle East, invades the Middle East. Now I want to take you back a little to one of our early writings, writing 160 odd years ago. One of our earliest writers, a Dr John Thomas wrote, when Russia makes its grand move, and he's commenting on Ezekiel 38, makes its grand move for building up the image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things is at hand. That's where we are now. Time is short. The long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be on the eve of becoming a fact. So the best sign, he says, is Russia will be on the move. So what do we expect? Well, here we are. Here is the area that's in the headlines at the moment. And so what we're expecting is that Russia must control, yes, Ukraine. It will make a future moves into that area. They are the words I quoted a few moments ago from Dr John Thomas in that book written 160 years ago based on Ezekiel 38. And what he says is this is what shall happen. Russia will unite with Ukraine. It will control Eastern and Western Europe and then it will invade into the Middle East. That's what we read about, didn't we? It will come out of the uttermost parts of the north into Israel. And that's what we're going to address a little tonight as we look at what's happening in the world scene. But let's first look at Ukraine. Okay, maybe just come back for a minute. There's Ukraine, Turkey, the Mediterranean. Here's the area of Ukraine, blown up a bit. The blue area is where the people are dominantly speaking Russia. Here they're using more the Ukrainian language. So here are people who have affiliated more with the Russian area. Well, in 2013, Ukraine found massive quantities of oil, enough to turn the pipelines off from Russia exporting into Europe and supply all of Europe from its own resources. Shell, Royal Dutch Shell signed a $2 billion deal to develop these fields, but it hasn't happened. Why? Because Russia has been moving, destabilising the earlier area. This year, by March the 25th, it had Crimea. And then it caused rebels to stand up in that eastern Ukrainian area, that blue coloured area where they dominantly speak Russia. There, these people began to seize power in various parts, seize government sites in 10 of the cities. Most people said it was a Russian invasion. Oh, Russia said, no, they aren't. These are Ukrainians. But have a look at what they're dressed in. It's not the normal clothing Ukrainians have. Look at the weapons they're bearing. It's not what you'd have under your bed. But these were rebels that were being armed by the Russians. That's what everybody is saying. And the evidence looks substantial. They then began to support those rebels, moving equipment into that area. Oh, they said, no, it's not. No, it's not. We're only bringing humanitarian aid into that area. But reinforcements, the experts are telling us, were secretly taken across the border into Ukraine. What happened was, forget about the other pictures for a moment, this convoy of 260 odd trucks came up to the border. They shifted it overnight to one place, then to another place. Before they did that move, somebody got on board them and had a look. What was inside was virtually nothing. No, mainly empty. But when they moved them over those two nights, before they crossed the border, it appears they put soldiers in there and brought them into the area, as well as equipment. And then subsequent to that, Russian equipment has come to the border of Ukraine, crossed into Ukraine. The Ukrainians sometimes accuse them and say, what are these doing here? Oh, they got lost. Rubbish. And now, of course, they're dominantly in that area of Ukraine. Here we are. Russia takes control of many of the cities in this area. Now it's expanded down and through to this area. And the papers are looking at this and saying, look, it's absolute chaos what's going on. Here was Ukraine wanting to join the EU and do things peacefully. And a cartoon was produced of it that summarises it very neatly. Mr Putin, doesn't look like him, but that's what they said it was. And here it is, Russia, trying to hold on to Ukraine trying to join the EU. But they didn't listen to Russia. Russia tried to stop them. 
and they still endeavoured to do it. So Putin acted, and the Big Bear was released. And that's what we've just seen as they've moved into that area and taking control of those areas. Staggering. But that's exactly what Scripture says. They will control that area and then move into the Middle East. How long have we got? Time is indeed very short. Let's move on a little bit with Russia for a moment. European leaders warn Russia invasion of eastern Ukraine at a point of no return. They're now looking at the situation. OK, two months ago, they said it's a point of no return. It's getting serious. It's a war that could threaten the whole of Europe. It's looking very, very dangerous. So they said to Russia, back off. And Russia came on television and broadcast warnings to America and to Eastern Europe, uh, and to Europe and said, we can turn you into volcanic dust overnight. And now, only a little while ago, now just a bit over a month, Vol Putin says, don't mess with us. It's best not to mess with us. Why? Because we have got nuclear weapons. In fact, they said we've got more than America. And now the evidence is substantial that they have. They've passed the number that America has got. So they are threatening that area. Russia is one of the leading nuclear powers. Now they believe he is the nuclear power. And as well as that, they've gone on further and said this. Look at the date. Only now, less than a month ago, and Moscow troops could be in five NATO capitals in two days, says Mr Putin. Two days! They've moved troops to the other side of Ukraine, on the western side, at a place called Kaliningrad. They've got them down in the south in Moldavia. They're surrounding Ukraine. But now they're threatening other NATO capitals if they continue to oppose Russia. If I wanted Russian troops could be in Kyiv and all these other capitals in two days. And how is Europe feeling about this? They're not very happy about it at all. Russia and Ukraine, Trump card is coming into play. They're afraid. Winter's on the way. Here's somebody all dressed up in Ukraine with warm clothes. Why? Well, it's there. Autumn now, and winter's coming fast. And when it does, where do they get their energy from? Where do they get their natural gas from? Where do they get their oil from? Russia. They rely on 40 to 80 per cent of their gas supplies from Russia. And sometimes the temperatures in Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe fall to minus 40 degrees centigrade. You know, sometimes we have it 40 degrees centigrade plus here. It's pretty hot. Just imagine that's inverted, how cold it is. People, Russia cut off the gas some years ago, just trialling things for a few days. And I think it was only about 45 people died, froze to death. But now the threat is... If they don't do what Russia wants, look where things could go this time. They could cut it off permanently. We'll have to see what this winter brings. But now, Daniel chapter 8, and most of the quotes I'm saving a bit of time from, but maybe this is one we could look at. Come with me to Daniel. It is a really interesting quote. I've got it all up there, but still, be that as it may, let's look at it. It's a very fascinating quote because it tells us a little bit about what Russia's going to be like. Now let's pick up with verse 25. And through his policy, and this power is the power which I believe is the power that Lee described in Ezekiel 38 as Gog, the leader of Russia. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. But he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without a hand. Now who's the prince of princes? The Lord Jesus Christ. And this power will oppose Christ. And we know from Ezekiel 38, that's what Russia will do. And he will be destroyed upon the mountains of Israel. But look at the tactics he's going to use. By craft and by peace. See, craft. The Rotherhams renders it by deceit. And by peace, he'll destroy many. 
So how is he achieving it? Well, we talked about it a few moments ago. These convoys that come up to the border now twice. Huge numbers of vehicles. Hardly loaded. And then they're loading equipment just on the border. Weaponry. Soldiers. And whipping them across the border. The paper's right. A Trojan horse. Troy fell, didn't it? They put this horse outside Troy and loaded it with soldiers. The people inside didn't know. And they thought for some reason that it was safe to drag it into the city. And overnight, these men came out of the horse and opened up the gates and the city fell overnight. Something of that nature is the tactics he's using. Deceit and cunning is the aim that he is using to take these areas. So we're seeing the things proceeding. Ukraine fights off attack at Donetsk aircraft at airport by pro-Russian forces. Ceasefire agreement has been riddled with violations by peace. This is what Russia said. We're offering peace. Nothing of the sort. The men are fighting on. A fragile but efficient peace process. That's what they're saying, but it's not true. And they're sneaking humanitarian aid. That's what they call it, weapons, into Ukraine. But coming back in mind to Ezekiel 38, we read a little while ago, didn't we, that speaking of Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. Something is going to cause her to come forward. She'll back off, she did many years ago. Maybe at the time when the Iron Curtain came down and peace came to Europe. No more longer the threat of Russia. But now, it's turned around. I'll put hooks in thy jaws. What's causing Russia to move? What's causing her to act? Well, she's got to act fast. Russia raises rates in a move seen as arming for sanctions. If you had money invested in Russia today, and you saw what Russia was doing, and the attitude of the Western world to it, what would you do? You'd move your money out fast, wouldn't you? Already, this was a while back, about three months ago, 75 billion had already been pulled out. Men, any, all the businessmen are pulling their money out as fast as they can from Russia. Things are looking really sick. NATO had a meeting in Wales, and they weren't terribly agreed, but one thing's for sure, this man was clear-minded. We will permanently damage Russia's economy. Britain, which of course is one of the big trading centres of the world, says we will act financially and make permanent damage to Russia. And it is happening. It is happening. And further to that, they're acting, some of the others are acting against it, and the oil price has collapsed. It's down to around about $80 a barrel, and if it below 90, Russia is not making a profit. They have to transport their oil a long way across uh, uh, Siberia and such like to Eastern Europe or Europe, and the cost of it is such that only when it's above $90 a barrel are they making a profit. Crude oil price was about that, but it's now down in the 80s, and it's having a crippling impact on Russia. Russia cannot wait. She's got to do something, or she'll be in deep trouble. But look, the scripture said it'd be allied with Magog, Germany, bigger than Germany, but dominantly the area of Germany. What's going on there? Well, Germany's opposing Russia, or is it? Mrs Merkel, the leader of Germany, is coming under pressure. German businesses urge a halt on sanctions against Russia. Just this week, Russia's, uh, Germany's economy has dropped fastest of all the economies in Europe. It's collapsing. Why? Well, it's not totally collapsing, I should say that, but it is going down rapidly. Well, this article written a while back gave the reasons. The GDP, if we oppose Russia, our biggest trading partner will go into the negative, our exports will go negative, and unemployment will climb, and will go a sudden overnight. We'll have 300,000 unemployed. And that's what's hit Russia, Germany. Here are some of the biggest companies in Germany and how much they've got invested in Russia. Here's one, 1,095 billion euro invested in Russia. 
And now the doors are closing on those investments because they're opposing Russia. And so the businessmen are saying to Mrs Merkel, cut it out. We cannot afford to do this. We're in deep trouble. Germany can't go down this line. The Bible said she won't. She will ally herself with Russia. As well as that, it said France would do the same. France and all her bands. Our commentator, Dr Thomas, many years ago said France will send her conquered and crestfallen host to do battle in the Battle of Armageddon in the Middle East. So she's not going to willingly accept Russia. She'll be crushed. But she will, therefore, be forced to come down. Look what's happening in France at the moment. France has been building a number of these ships for Russia. The first one has just been completed and come off the gangway down in the ocean, and some 400 sailors came from Russia to take, it, take over and to pay them the money for that ship. But what's that, what have they done? France halts delivery of warship to Russia in a protest at the role in Ukraine. Oh, you've invaded Ukraine? We're not going to give you these ships. That will inflame Russia. And no doubt, ultimately, result in Russia coming in and crushing France. But the key word in Ezekiel 38, now if you haven't marked it in, some of the younger ones particularly, now I can't leave this up for very long, I have enough time tonight, but the key word is the he word is company. It's very, very important to note that. It's a Hebrew word kahal, and it is used more often in this chapter than any other. I think there's one other chapter which is exactly the same number, but be that as it may, it is the key word in this chapter. What does it mean? Well, the commentators tell us it's associated with a religious company or a religious assembly. But it's talking about an army. You see that word there, company? There's the noun, there's the verb from which the word company comes. So they are cognate words. They mean basically the same. It's a religious assembly of men or soldiers that are coming in. It's backed religiously. They're united because they hold to the same religion, fundamentally. What's the religion? It's a religion of Roman Catholicism, coming from Italy. It's interesting. Finland and Italy, at that conference, or after that conference, opposed new European Union sanctions over events in Ukraine. They said, we don't support opposing Russia. We support her. Well, they may not have said we openly support her, but they were not going to oppose her. The Prime Minister of Italy, a new Prime Minister, not Mr Berlusconi, he's gone, but this new man, Renzi, very popular man, I don't know if anybody knows why, but the reason he is, before he became Prime Minister of Italy, he was a comedian. Seems to be able to appeal to the people very well. But anyhow, there he is. Look what he's saying. He says, we must form a United States of America? No, Europe. A United States of Europe. And that's the way we must go. And we must be affiliated with Russia. We'll come back to that in a minute. Well, maybe we could think about it for a second. Think of the Daniel's image. What are those toes? The iron toes, iron and clay toes? They're European. The colour iron speaks of Rome, doesn't it? So here we can see that there is to be a weak alliance between Europe, the states of Europe, which will hold it together. And here he is. That's what he's aiming to see. But let's come on with religion. In Russia, what's going on up there? Well, this man, Mr Putin, is allying himself with the leader of Russian Orthodox Church, Mr Kirill. And uh, what is he doing? Look at the date, it's a little bit dated, but he's opened 25,000 churches since he's become president again. On average, he's been opening them at the rate of three churches every day in the country. He's going through with all the churches that are closed by the communists and opening them up, gaining the favour of the people. He's opened up 805 monasteries in Russia. Putin urges Russia to return to the values of religion. 
He's getting religion behind him. Isn't that what we said in Ezekiel 38? We read that. A company, a company, a company. A religious backing to that invasion into the Middle East. Staggering, isn't it? The pace, the degree to which things are happening. But now let's move on. If you come with me back to Ezekiel 38, well, we can read it from here, but it's good to follow it through. In Ezekiel 38, he says to us in verse 10, that thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time thou shalt think an evil thought. That's the nations invading this area of the Middle East. This religious assembly of nations will have an evil thought. Now, what's the evil thought? Look at verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as, against, as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days. So they come against Israel. Their aim is to destroy Israel. Now, we've just had, only a few months ago, the Gazan War, didn't we? Fighting with Gaza. And as that was taking place, look what happened in Europe, Italy. Oh, it wasn't just Europe, but dominantly there. Spain, Poland, Belgium, Sweden. Protests on the streets. Huge protests. Look at the date. Worldwide protests against Israel attack on Gaza. It was this serious that the papers said it's the worst since Hitler. They said it was worse than the crystal night. The scale not seen since the times of Hitler. They pursue Jews in the streets of Berlin as in 1938. On the Sabbath, in both Paris and in, London, and in Berlin, they needed a thousand police to safely bring the Jews home to their homes. And only eight synagogues were burnt, not burnt down. Fire brigades saved them, but people attempted to burn them down. The situation is serious. A hatred is growing indeed in that Middle East, in the area of Europe. And no doubt will support that invasion coming into the area of Israel. But in Daniel chapter 11, time's not probably with us to look at it in detail, but the king of the north shall come against him. Now, the early part of that verse speaks of the time of World War I, when the king of the south, which was the Tarshan powers, pushed against Constantinople or the Ottoman, and pushed them out of Israel. And then it says, the king of the north shall come against Turkey, the Ottoman power. So we expect, therefore, an invasion from Russia, the king of the north, against Turkey. Is that likely? Look at this. Here we are, we're going back a little. But as they moved into Crimea and controlled Crimea, March the 25th, was all over, but as they were doing that, Prime Minister of Turkey, Ergenen, opposed Russia and went on the media and spoke firmly. He says, Russia, if you take control of Crimea and Ukraine and persecute the Tatars, who are ethnically Turkish, our people, as you traditionally have done, you've often done it, we'll close the Bosporus. The paper was aghast at that statement. It's not the thing you should be saying to Russia. He even commented that way. But that obviously had had no impact on him. And he has repeated that since that time. That that Bosporus waterway, the only waterway allowing Russia to get its fleet from uh, Sevastopol out into the Mediterranean, will be closed, they said, if they're cruel to the Tatar people. So things are looking pretty tricky there. Our writer, many years ago again, Dr Thomas, said, we, speaking of the believers, have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople. He says, it's my opinion, and he was basing this upon Revelation chapter 16, that Russia would not take Turkey before Christ returns. But he will take Turkey, and that will be after Christ has Return to the believers. So then, let's remind ourselves of what's happened. So these countries, we can see all of them, are showing signs where they will be associated with Russia. 
But now we want to centre our attention more a little on that area for a moment. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13, it spoke of a group of nations that would oppose Russia. It speaks, verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil, to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So the power we want to look at first is Tarshish, who opposes Russia. We haven't time to prove this tonight, but if you'd like to ask me afterwards, I'll show that to you. But that power is Britain. Britain. What's Britain doing? Britain is very upset with the EU. Some time ago, this man got voted into power. He's a German. He is a Jesuit. He is, Russia, Cameron says, he is a liar and a cheat. And he went over to the EU and verbally himself spoke against the vote. The vote went two votes against, voting him in. 25-4. And the paper said Britain's ready to leave. Britain has been forming trading alliances with the old Commonwealth countries for some time. She's firming it up. She's trying to get herself in a position, I believe, where she can move out. And that seems to be her aim. And so they were extremely upset with this man coming into power. And so, a little later on, showing again the spirit of Britain this time in support of Israel. Remember, it poses Russia and the alliance when it comes into the Middle East. This year, March the 13th, David Cameron went to Knesset, went over to the parliament in Israel, the Knesset, and stood up there and he said his support for Israel was unbreakable. We are with you, Israel. Our commitment to Israel's security will always be rock solid, said he. And associated with Mr Cameron, Britain, is the other group of nations, all the young lions thereof, the Commonwealth countries. How are they going? Are they pro-Israel too and stand with Britain? Here's the Prime Minister of Canada. This year again, he went over to see Israel. Stephen Harper. They got the red carpet out for him. The Knesset was full of people as he spoke positively of Israel and his support for Israel. I don't know if you know this man. Okay. In his election speech, there he is with his family when he got elected in. In his election speech, he said this. We are firmly committed to restoring the Australian-Israeli friendship to the strength that enjoyed under Howard government. We're back where we were and we will support Israel. Do you know who this is the Prime Minister of? India. The biggest election the world has ever seen. Billions voted. And he got a landslide victory. A very, very popular man. And the Indians came to him and said, look, it's all very well you getting into power, but we're going backwards really economically. We're not going ahead. We need to catch up with China. Can you do it? He said, too right. Too right. How are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to get people in here who will advise us. And they said, who? He says, I'm very good friend with the Jews from Israel. We'll get them in to tell us what we can do with our economy. And the paper in Israel said India's new Prime Minister touted as Israel's best friend in Southeast Asia. And he has promised to visit Israel very shortly. Make a trip across to see Israel. And he is indeed a very, very supportive of the Jews. Well, Joel says to us, as this time comes closer and closer, beat your plowshares into swords. Arm, arm. And that's indeed what we're seeing. Here's the front page of the New Statesman. They were seeing the looming problem that we've already seen. Look at the date. It's back there in March when Crimea fell. And they said, Russia's going to come down. Now, we don't believe it's going to come necessarily into these areas, but we do believe it will come into the Middle East because that's what the Bible says. That's their guess, but what a wise guess it was because they can see the spirit of Russia. But now come to the Middle East. Chaotic. Look at it. Ezekiel 38 says, 
with Russia will be Persia. That's Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And what it says to us that he's going to invade this area, it's going to be the silver area here. For that to happen, you've got to be a pretty powerful country to get control of it. Let's go back to our old writer. What did he say? The Shiites of Persia and the Sunnis hate each other with a hatred not exceeded by that with which the orange men or the Protestants of Ireland have for the Catholics of Ireland. They hate each other and she, Persia, will be led to indulge in dreams of extending her frontier in the directions of Baghdad by the aid of Russia. Is that what's been happening? Well, this is what's taken place from Syria. This ISIS crowd is swept in here and those yellow areas is where it's gone. Today, right at this moment, it's out toward the west of Ukraine, Baghdad and threatening Baghdad. So they swept in there with a brutal sweep. Up here in the area of Mosul, when they came to the city, the Iraqi soldiers just took off their uniforms, threw their guns away and ran. The ISIS captured them and got rid of them. They were swept down through here and threatened Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has brought 30,000 troops to the border here. Jordan has got help from Israel, not soldiers, but help from Israel, from America, to support them in Jordan. So they're sweeping through, but it's weakening that area. They're fighting against each other. When Russia comes down, there's probably not going to be a lot left, and it's going to be a lot easier to take control. Russia, though, has already been supporting Baghdad. The only place that immediately brought weapons into Baghdad. Baghdad, at the very first sign of it, asked for America to bring help, Iran to bring help. Nobody did it. They asked Russia and immediately in came equipment. But you see, we know the major thrust ultimately is going to be coming into this area. He will also enter into the glorious land. We read equivalent in Ezekiel 38. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these escape out of his hand. Eden, Ammon and Moab. Where's that? That's the area of Jordan. And already today, British and American troops are in that area. Dominantly American, I might add. But they are seeking help because they are being threatened from the area of Iraq into Jordan. So where do they get their help? USA, Israel, aid, Jordan amid the ISIS threat. Israel said, our missile defence network will, allow, will spread so it covers you, Jordan. You are safe. We will secure you. And America sent troops in there and equipment in there over the last few years and a little more recently. So the Hashemite Jordanian kingdom is a close Israeli-American ally. But as well as that, it's more than that, it's a trading alliance with Israel. They haven't been able to successfully get their gas supplies coming in from Egypt. So they've signed a $500 million deal to bring it from Israel. Signed earlier this year and re-signed just recently and confirmed. But now let's look at Israel. What's going on there? The Bible says that when Russia comes down, in the latter days they shall come into the land that is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel is the West Bank. A little later on it says, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations that dwell in the midst of the land. And that word midst is only used twice in the Bible. And the other quote is in Judges and it's used at the mountains of Judea. It's the West Bank. But the West Bank's not controlled by Israel, is it? Well, after the Gaza War, or during the Gaza War, Israel put soldiers in here and Netanyahu said Israel must stay in the West Bank for a very long time. Prime Minister Netanyahu said Israel would have to maintain a long-term military presence in the West Bank. If we don't, the ISIS will sweep into this area, he said. And they could shell from there Tel Aviv, we're not leaving. It's caused a lot of opposition. 
around the world. But that was his feeling at that time. But what about Israel itself? Should be in unwalled villages at rest, dwelling securely without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Well, it's just been having a war. Doesn't look like it, does it? But with the close of that war, Arab leaders view Hamas as worse than Israel. And Israel pilled for peace. Two years ago, Israel found itself pressed from all sides by unfriendly Arab neighbours to end the fighting. Not this time. A new coalition, Jordan, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, was with Israel. It's fascinating, isn't it? Well, what's going to happen to the Gaza Strip? Again, returning to our writer, he said, quoting from working on the basis of Joel 3, Tyre and Zidon and the coast of Palestine, which is the Gaza Strip, will be associated with the latter-day antagonist of Gog, that's, that's the Tarshan power, Britain. Look what's going on. Gaza war. Well, can't tell you the figures relative to Perth, but it's about twice the size of Adelaide, three times maybe. Population, three times the population of Adelaide. Terribly poor people. All right? But they started a war. One week later, Israel moved against them. And look what happened to Gaza left in an utter mess, left in a shambles. So what's going to be the answer? Finally, after thousands died from the Gazan Strip area, massive amounts of buildings absolutely devastated, where's the answer? Well, Mr Netanyahu says it must be internationally supervised the militarisation zone. In other words, we're going to have to get another country in here to marshal those borders and make sure weapons do not go into it. An international framework for the demilitarisation of Gaza Strip is the answer. And what's going to happen? Well, while the Gaza war was on, there was a conflict in the British government. And that man, the Foreign Minister of Britain, stood down. Gaza conflict called split between main UK party. Cameron's party had a conflict and he stood down and a new man was put in power. And within a few days, I think about four or five days, he flew to Israel. And he said, Britain has been very clear that Israel has the right to defend itself and its citizens. Israel welcomed his moral clarity. Well, they were thrilled with his words. And they would be, wouldn't they? They would be. So we can see everything we're expecting is coming to pass. What about Israel? Rich in silver and gold, cattle and goods, economically strong. Oh yes, it's found oil. But here we are for some of our young people here. They're a brilliant company, country in starting up companies and making money. They're amazing. Here's a company some of us might have heard about. Some young men came out of the army, put their feet up in front of their computer and worked on it for a couple of years. About a year or so, produced this company called Viber. Just this year, sold it to Japan for a cool 900 million. Not bad kickoff from the first company they started. And that's happening all over Israel. Israel is brilliant financially. And its skills are stunning. But now, let's return to where we were started. Luke 21, the words of the Lord said that this to us. There shall be upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, no way out. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Look over in the eastern states. It's been pretty good over here in Western Australia. But over in the eastern states, we're getting worried. In Sydney, they had a 500, sorry, 800 police raid 200, uh, 27 houses because of terrorism. Terrifying scene. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. Israel said three months ago there are 11,000 terrorists trained, ready to go back into Europe and into Britain. And they said explosive material has been developed which cannot be easily detected going on planes. They can make it into a shirt. They are having operations where they put explosives inside their body and return it. The French heard it. 
And the French began rounding up people coming in from this area where the ISIS is. They hadn't committed a crime, they just put them in prison for four years. I said, we can't take the risk. America asked for all aircraft going into America to be thoroughly checked. But so far, things haven't moved too badly yet. But look what it goes on to say. So here we are. There's that 11,000 terrorists. Never has the West seen the likes of a terrorist army on this scale, says Israel, the Debka site. And we know the scare that they're having. Let's not look at that in any detail. But they're brutal, utterly brutal. And here's the leader of Saudi Arabia. Look at the date. And what has he said? He said, they have wrapped up plans for a coordinated terrorist attack. He thought September 11 didn't happen. But he says at least after a month or two, it'll reach Europe and America. And he warned about these operations being made, the explosive being laid, added to their bodies, secret explosive substance that cannot be detected. He went on media reporting that. Frightening world. As well as that, virus is spreading. We need antibodies to survive the virus, but we haven't got them for Ebola. It's spiralling out of control. Catastrophic loss of life. We don't know where it's going. How long can we hand, handle this if it gets out of hand? Do you know a few years ago, Mr Abbott was the health minister of Australia and he had a conference they held at Alice Springs so that couldn't be easily reported on. Then they were worried about bird flu and he said, we'll close the borders of Australia totally. No ships, no planes, no visitors. Full stop. If this comes, what could happen here? The world is in a scary state, a fearful state. It's not only there. Lastly, look at yesterday's paper. Mar market carnage carries chilling message for us. And what's happening in Europe? They're now going to charge you interest rate to put money in your bank because they can't invest. They don't know what to do with the money. It's a real problem to them. The economy of Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Ireland, and all of those are moving down rapidly at the moment. And so the Australians said, huge problem. Where will it end? We don't know. Might be only a thing of a moment. But it's frightening what we're seeing. But let's return to what Jesus said. And these shall be upon the earth, distress of nation, these shall be upon the earth, distress of nation with perplexity. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And he says, when that happens, when it begins to come to pass, he says to us, prepare. Because the day of redemption is nearly here. Have we done that which is necessary to be ready when Christ comes? He will come. It is the great subject of the Bible. Christ will return. No less than 318 times in the New Testament. The great promise of the Bible. The great hope for this world, the only hope. He will return and when he does, he'll set up a just kingdom. A caring kingdom. Worldwide kingdom. Where true justice is executed. Worldwide peace. None of the foolish chaos that we're seeing on the world today. But ladies and gentlemen, what about us? What are we doing? That's the issue. Just before he ascended to heaven, he gave these critical words of warning. Final words, words of love, really, and care for all of us. And he said, look, I want you to do something. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, that's what we're doing tonight. It's gospel means good news. You might not think what I said was good news, but it is good news. Because what it's telling us is Christ's return is coming soon. And when it does, it will be good. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Now it's pretty straightforward. There are three basic steps. What are those steps? Believe the good news taught by the apostles, the truth of the Bible. And having done that, become baptised by total immersion into water accepting and committing ourselves to follow in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put aside the old way. 
and dedicate ourselves to following in the example of Christ. And then, lastly, continue faithfully until he comes. Don't deviate, but be found faithful until the Lord returns. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the time is exceedingly short. As we look out upon the scene, it's hard to know how long we've got. Maybe years, maybe months. But one thing's for sure, it's important that we very seriously look at how we are walking in the sight of God. So that indeed at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we might find a place in that kingdom shortly to be set up on this earth. Thank you.